Okay, thank you. Mm-hmm. All right, it sounds like if we're getting some additional people joining us today. That's wonderful. And it looks as if we've got callers from across the state. So thank you for reaching out. We're enjoying a, a pretty pleasant day of fall here in Helena. ready to start today, um, we just wanted to go over a couple of housekeeping items. And that is, uh, while we proceed through the call, uh, you're welcome to use the star six uh, control to mute your line. And if you have questions and, and want to interact with the call, uh, you're welcome to press star seven to unmute your line. And during the course of the call, if you could please mute your line uh, so that we can avoid background noise with the group, that would be wonderful. And you can use the chat function throughout the webinar to send us questions, or you're welcome to wait for the end of the session uh, for, uh, when we'll do a Q&A. And I do need to let you know that this call is being recorded. So with that, it is a two o'clock, and I just want to again welcome everybody to the call today. This is Emily Kovarik, CFO with the Montana Community Foundation. I'm here in our office here in Helena, joined with a couple of our other staff, Kathy Cooney, Riley Meredith, and presenting on the call today will be myself and Mary Rutherford, our CEO, Mike Gustafson, the chair of our investment committee, as well as John Hedge, who is our Wealth Management Advisor, First Vice President of Investments with Merrill Lynch Global Wealth Management. Right. To start today, I'd like to, I, I'm pleased to be able to introduce to you Mary Rutherford, our CEO. She's got some exciting updates that she'd like to present and talk to the group about. Mary? Thanks, Emily. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay, yeah. great. I'm, for those of you on the call, I'm actually across town, um, stepped out of a meeting in the Capitol, so I'm on my cell phone on, with my headphones on. So this is kind of a fun way to be talking with you all. Thanks for patching in. Um, I just wanted to share with you a few highlights, and then I will be leaving the call and stepping back into my other meeting. Just, just this June, the Community Foundation Board adopted a new strategic plan. And our primary goal is to be the go-to place for philanthropy in Montana. Driven by this intergenerational transfer of wealth, we will work diligently to have um, accumulated $100 million in assets for the benefit of Montana over the next five years. Currently, we have just almost well, between 70 and 74 in there, depending on endowed versus non-endowed. So we have some pretty strong goals, but we know that it's important to grow the asset base to provide the sustainable source of funding for Montana's benefit in the, in the future and forever. So in keeping with that, we'll, we'll be having a strong focus on um, gift development and primarily planned giving as well as working with local community foundations and um, other partners such as corporations and foundations across Montana and beyond. Uh, we'll see a, uh, we aspire to provide even better donor services to our partners, and you'll see us doing a lot more outreach um, with our current donors, with local community foundations, particularly as it relates to legacy building. Uh, you'll hear today from 
um, John and Emily and Mike about the, the financial management of our investments and the strong performance of our endowment and our, and our keen eye on watching that performance. You'll also see, um, or you may not see, but the board will be focused on diversifying operating sources of revenue. We aspire to rank in the top 25th quartile of community foundations in terms of investment results. So it's definitely setting some measurable goals there. And also we'll be assessing our fee structure to ensure that philanthropy is accessible and sustainable um, for MCF. If you haven't seen it already, um, we've added great staff that have brought incredible um, talent and expertise to the Montana Community Foundation in the person of Riley Meredith. You'll see stronger uh, communications coming from MCF and brand amplification, um, broad-based communication, and hopefully some pretty impactful storytelling. You'll also see us continuing to strengthen our networks with professional advisors, attorneys, accountants, trust officers across Montana, and the local community foundation community as well. You'll also see um, us launching into more community impact work, um, which will be evidenced by our new competitive grant making program that the board approved this year. And we should be announcing next spring a competitive uh, grant making program across Montana. And that committee is just assembling now to determine kind of the scope of the areas that we'll be focusing on. But I'll tell you, they will definitely align with our strategic priorities of education, human needs, arts and culture, economic self-sufficiency, natural resource stewardship, leadership, and civic dialogue. Um, you, you've seen or you, you may have seen that we've um, modified our local community foundation focus. Um, our, our LCF Plus um, matching grant program um, has come to its final stages and that has morphed partially into our new competitive grant making program. You also may have seen or heard or actually even met our new Director of the Montana Office of Gift Planning, Amy Sullivan, who's joined our staff and is traveling around the state working with professional advisors, um, generous individuals, and local community foundations to create legacy funds to benefit Montana. The only um, individual fund that the Montana Community Foundation holds that has a dedicated staff person to that fund specifically is the Women's Foundation of Montana. And I hope that you've seen some of the fruits of the work of that group from the participation in the Governor's um, Equal Pay Task Force to um, issues affecting women and children across Montana. And Jen Yule continues to serve in that role and really elevate um, issues of women and girls across our great state. And finally, I would, I would let you know that um, we are in the, in the process of identifying and recruiting new board members. We have a strong board of committed individuals, eight folks now who serve on the MCF board. And we are in the process of, of recruiting and identifying potential board members as well as committee members that the board will be electing to serve on the board um, at the annual meeting in November. So that gives you a, a pretty high level update review of what's happening at the Montana Community Foundation. I would just say um, the organization is in incredible hands with a, a strong board and a, and a great staff who are committed to Montana's future. So with that, I will pass the meeting back to Emily and thank you all for tuning in. And please know you can always reach me via my email address or at the office. And um, if you have if you don't have that information, you can find it readily at our web website. So thanks so much for catching in. Thanks, Mary. Thank you so much, Mary. So with that general update of what's happening at MCF, I'd like to move our webinar presentation forward to talking more specifically about our investments and the update of how things have been um, progressing with our portfolio and our current investment allocations. And with that, I'd like to introduce Mike Gustafson. He is the chair of our investment committee and has been one of our 
our fine committed board members over the last several years. Mike is the President and CEO of Wesco Resources in Billings, an oil and gas exploration and coal development company. Mike, if you could please uh, say a few words, that would be wonderful. Uh, thanks, Emily. Um, and I want to thank all of you on behalf of our investment committee for taking the time to participate in today's webinar. Uh, very quickly, uh, on page 7, I guess, um, you'll see uh, the folks that participate on the investment committee of the Montana Community Foundation Board. Let me make a couple comments very quickly there. We have two members that are non-members of the board that participate on the investment committee. They are Jack King of Billings and Alice Kuhn of uh, Ekalaka. Both of them bring their their uh, background uh, and history with this this board uh, uh, to the investment committee, and uh, and particularly they provide a lot of expertise for our deliberations. Um, the investment committee basically has four quarterly meetings uh, a year to review the portfolio of the Montana Community Foundation. Uh, that could vary. Uh, we could have meetings more often than that, uh, depending on the, on the market conditions and other decisions that require a uh, more immediate response. But I just want to assure you that this committee is, uh, meets quarterly to review the, uh, the work of uh, Merrill, Merrill Lynch. And uh, John Hedge will be speaking about that later. Um, one of the things that we have very that we have really focused on is to diversify this portfolio uh, appropriately uh, uh, to preserve uh, uh, the the capital and more importantly to grow the portfolio and to try to exceed the costs and the inflationary indexes and also we measure this against other indexes that are common in terms of uh, portfolio performance. Uh, as uh, Mary said, that uh, we like to achieve the, the top quartile if that's possible. Uh, in this volatile market, uh, it makes it that much more difficult, of course, as we move forward, and John will speak to that in a few moments. Uh, in general, uh, our guidelines are about 65% equities and about 27.5% uh, fixed income and cash. and. Uh, roughly 7.5% in alternative investments. Currently, we're, in simple terms, we're about 70% equities and 30% in cash, or excuse me, 30% in uh, alternatives in cash, uh, which um, I think is a good place to be, and John, again, will speak to that. Emily, I have nothing further, uh, and I think we can turn to John at this point. That'll be, that'll be great, Mike. Uh, John, if you would like to take us into the next steps of talking about our investment update. You bet. Thank you very, very much. And thank you everyone for joining the call. Again, my name is John Hedge, and I'm with uh, Merrill Lynch Institutional Consulting. It's a group uh, you know, headquartered out of uh, our Jersey City office, but we're fortunate to not, enough to be with Institutional Consulting and be able to live here in uh, Billings, Montana and cover a four-state area. So that brief amount of background, <clears throat> uh, slide eight, just gives you uh, an update uh, last 20 years the, uh, would, that would show the overall value of the pooled portfolio. It would be uh, so the graph is broken down. The bars on the lower would be the net amount of contributions, net of contributions into the portfolio. And of course, the line above is the total value of the portfolio, and the difference would be uh, cumulative investment earnings. I thought that would just be a way to kind of put it in perspective. And as you can see in the pooled account, there's north of uh, 68 million. And uh, I think Mary had mentioned that when you throw, uh, put our, our aggregate all of the accounts, they were north of 70 million. Uh, and if I would have, I think probably what I'll have you do, Emily, is just advance the slide. If we go to slide nine. Yes. Thank you. 
many folks, what I'm going to do is I'm going to spend oh, five minutes or so, just give you a, a feeling or an update of some of the data the investment committee considers as well as management in determining what we would call both long-term and short-term uh, asset allocation and tactical asset allocation moves. So page nine, one of the things that many folks are asking these days with the market, you can see the chart on the left there, the S&P 500, that's a, that's a good proxy for the U.S. stock market. Off its lows, it's uh, up significantly, off its lows. And, and some folks are saying, well, uh, have we hit a, a peak and um, is there anything really left in the U.S. stock market? One of the basic or if there is a central or probably a most important factor to look at and help valuing the markets, a lot of folks look at what is called this forward P.E. ratio, and it's a, a price-earnings ratio that is very central to giving you an idea of just how fully valued or how, in our terms, we sometimes call the rich or cheap the market is. And if you go to the bottom right there, the S&P previous peaks versus today, if you go down about the middle of the table, does everyone focus on the forward PE there? And you can see back in 2000, it was 25 times earnings. In 2007, 15 times earnings. And today, 15.6 times earnings. That's a very reasonable PE ratio, which tells us that the market, the fundamentals of the market, stock market, are not overvalued. And so we're still very positive and constructive. And we'll see the reasons why later on the U.S. stock market. The next slide would be slide 10. And the other thing that's <clears throat> very positive in our business, or w w how we view the markets, is that when uh, things are out of favor, that can actually be very good for the markets. In other words, uh, You've probably heard, when was the last time anything had a bubble when it was unliked or unloved? Meaning, do we all recall the real estate bubble, right? Everyone wanted real estate. And then we all recall the technology bubble. Everyone wanted technology. Well, what we don't see today is a real bubble in stock ownership. You can kind of scan through there to three bullets. But the third bullet is a recent Gallup poll shows that the percentage of Americans with money invested in the stock market is still near a 15-year low. And that's good for the markets. That's because, or that's good for potential upside in the markets because there's still a lot of folks who have been sitting on the sidelines because there is this wall of worry, whether it's ISIS or terrorist threats or everything else that uh, prevents people from be getting back in the stock market. So that's actually good for the markets. If we go to the next slide, the other thing that is, and I, I went over this with the audience last time, and, and this is very, very important. It, back in 2008, if you look at the chart, it shows that since 2008, bond inflows into bond funds have been over $1.3 trillion. And money flowing out of stocks or equities, we use the, that term interchangeably, has been about $0.8 trillion. That tells us, again, that the uh, market is not overly loved. There's still a lot of folks that have not come back in to the stock market. And again, that's one of the reasons we think the market is still fairly priced, is that there's still this wall of worry and folks haven't trended back in. If you look on the bottom of page 11 to the lower right, you can see the inflows since the beginning of 2013. There's been some inflows into equity markets, uh, over $355 billion. There's been some flows into bond market, $137 billion. All that's been basically coming out of cash. So again, uh, not, a, not, not a huge rotation into stocks. We still think there's a lot more uh, people and organizations that will ultimately own stocks for the investment return. If we go to the next slide, the other thing that's just a phenomenal, it's a phenomenal amount of cash. If you look at the bottom right on page 12, non-financial corporate cash, it's over $1.6 trillion is sitting on the balance sheets 
of corporate America, non-financial uh, companies. And companies are going to do something with that. The second bullet down, they're either going to do share buybacks, dividends, uh, mergers and acquisition, capital expenditures, all of which we think are also positive for the market going forward. And then next page, there's always risks, right? So some of the risks that we're following as an organization and the investment committee is watching is that we know that there has been a lot of incentives behind this market. It's, uh, um, there's been a seven-year liquidity boom, a lot, of, a lot of liquidity out there provided by the feds. And uh, we also know that uh, there could be some, uh, we all know of a lot of geopolitical concerns that could continue to increase volatility in the upcoming months. So that's a concern. The other couple bullets there is if the U.S. GDP slows down, um, that could be a concern. It's held strong here recently, continues to hold pretty strong. Third bullet, negative returns occurring in only five of the last 27 months. The S&P 500 at some point is likely to have some sort of a significant correction. You can see the chart on the bottom of that page. There's been some corrections, but they've been very, very minor over the last uh, couple of years. So. Again, that's a risk. And again, we all know what's going on with credit shock, emerging market debt. Um, there's a lot of issues in, in, uh, in Europe that could continue to unravel the market. Having said all that, those are risks. We're watching for them. Managers are watching for them. But still, the fundamentals are pretty good, pretty, impl uh, pretty solid um, for continued, we believe, expansion. Uh, in the uh, um, stock market. Right? We go to page 14. All of that summarizes what our research investment committee, that's what the RIC stands for. Our research investment committee would say that if you have an, a moderate investor or strategic allocation, very similar to the community foundation, that we would still be overweighting stocks about 10% of the stock allocation. So if the long-term investment policy said 60% stock, we're overweighting stocks up to 66%. And you're going to see that's exactly where MCF is, being uh, overweighted in stocks for all the reasons we just talked about. So again, we're, uh, the investment committee and management at MCF takes take this very seriously, they monitor this, and they are very diligent about making asset allocation tweaks. If we go to the next slide. John, this is Emily. Yeah. If I could just pause for a moment and ask the group if there's any questions so far. Well. Is that... Does someone want to um, speak up with a question? Because you're welcome to do so at this time. Um, not, All sure right. I, not sure I can be heard. Yes, you can. We hear you. Oh, great. Um, John, could you go back to page 11? Maybe I, uh, I missed something there, but uh, when I looked at it, it didn't look like the bullet point number uh, three matched the graph on the right hand side, $333 billion in uh, equities, $137 in bonds for the year. And the bullet numbers, are they different? Yeah, you have a very sharp eye and it, it's a little bit tricky. The uh, lower right actually takes you back to January 13. And so if you look at January 14 for the year, that's the, where, where the numbers are. But good eye. Good catch. Okay. All right. Thanks for that question. Are there any other questions so far? All right. With that, um, John, maybe we can move on to slide 15. Yeah, so now we're going to bring it down to uh, Montana Community Foundation portfolio. The actual, you can see your actual strategic target there, which uh, Mike Gustaf had 
Gustafson had mentioned earlier, where you have a strategic or a long-term investment policy target of total stocks of 65% and then 27.5% in fixed income and cash and 7.5% in alternative investments. You can see we have ranges, minimums and maximums, and that brings great discipline to the organization. And what it does is it forces the organization into a very disciplined model for rebalancing the portfolio and so that we don't get caught chasing returns or asset class returns. On the far right, what you have is you have the manager allocation at June 30th. And you can see, if you were to look at domestic equities, our long-term target is 45% in U.S. stocks, but yet we're at 51%. And that drives back to that tactical overweight to domestic stocks that we talked about in the earlier uh, graph based upon the fundamental research of where we think there's some attractive opportunities in the market. You can also see where we're underweight fixed income and cash, the target is 27.5%, and the allocation is at 20. So we're uh, right at the minimum allocation to fixed income, and that is because if interest rates were to rise, fixed income returns would suffer. So this is a very important chart looked at all the time, constantly monitored for tactical and strategic asset allocation decisions. If we go to page 16. I have a question. Yes. What, are the, what is made up in the alternative investments category? What, what are the alternative investments? What would that be? Very good question. Numerous, there would be dozens, but there would be things such as managers that could go long investments or short investments, meaning that you could uh, short stocks. There would be some in there that would be hedge funds where they could um, – uh, invest, again, in um, uh, long, short, and all kinds of other derivatives, which would be tied to uh, the volatility of foreign markets, U.S. markets, something that would derive the, uh, returns off volatility. You would have private equity in there. Your private equity is doing extremely well right now. You would have a small amount of private equity in there. Uh, so it would be, I think there's probably 20 to 30 different alternative investment managers in there. Thank you. You bet. Other questions? Next slide. This gives you an idea, actually, is a great lead-in question. If you kind of look at some of the, uh, we call them buckets or asset classes, you can see you're extremely well diversified. Large cap growth, that would be U.S., large cap value. And there are seasons of time where certain of these asset classes do extremely well relative to others and struggle relative to others. And we're kind of in one of those periods right now. Diversification over the last couple of years has really not helped. The U.S. stock market has been very, very strong. And diversification away from the U.S. stock market has not been helpful in the last couple of years. However, with the discipline that we have and all markets go in cycles, that has uh, forced us as, uh, in the portfolio to continuous, continuously rebalance by trimming from some of the asset classes that have been very much in favor or hot, however you want to talk about it, and reallocating to some of those asset classes that have been less in favor. And so we're in one of those trends right now. Uh, early in the year, the Montana Community Foundation made a very uh, good move. They trimmed quite a bit of money from their small cap portfolio, and that was a very wise decision because small cap had had such a wonderful couple years returns in 2012 and 2013. They actually trimmed small cap and reallocated it to some of the other strategies. So that's an example of the discipline that you, we need in these kind of environments. So this gives you a feel just how diversified you are and the availability to be able to move money between asset classes uh, to take care of opportunities, or take advantage of opportunities, I mean. Page 17. Having said all that, here's just the annualized returns, and then we have in the next uh, uh, 
page will go through returns uh, by year against benchmarks. But this just gives you a feel. Year to date, uh, at the end of June, the portfolio was about 3.4%. Uh, the end of June, everything was doing kind of okay in the markets. Nothing was real strong. U.S. stocks were up about five. Small cap stocks were up about two. Bonds were up about two. International stocks were up about four. So when you put the composite together, that gave the 3.4% return. And you can see your uh, ending one, three, five, and ten year returns. What's been real interesting about this year is that since June, the really the only major asset class that continues to do okay are U.S. stocks. Everything else from June has actually gone uh, downhill or had negative returns from June. Small cap stocks, I mentioned that earlier, have struggled since June. International has struggled. And um, I guess the only other thing that's grown a little bit since June are bonds. So, so anyway, it's in one of those real volatile periods, Mike had mentioned it earlier. And I think we all see the reason why the U.S. stock market is continues to do fine, uh, but markets globally continue to struggle. A lot of that is Europe, geopolitical concerns, and other risks. If we go to page seven, 18, this is what Mike had mentioned earlier as well, is that the investment committee is very interested in determining how the portfolio does against various indexes that are out there. And you can see in 2013, the portfolio would have exceeded the index, and 2012 would have. 2011 would have underperformed the index. So I'll let your eyes scan across there, and you can see that in the last nine years, the portfolio has outperformed some of the, the benchmarks uh, six of the nine times. 2014, we don't know yet. Um, a lot of volatility, and it will be interesting to see how the year closes. Next slide. One last thing I think that's very important to look at and very much on everyone's mind on the Investment Committee and Management and Montana Community Foundation is risk. How much risk are we really taking in the portfolio? So we look at risk over various periods of time, but one of the things we've looked at is just risk really since the recovery in, in 08. You can see the total portfolio is uh, right on top of the risk uh, of the of the benchmark or uh, of uh, the indices, and you can see where the global equity is because you have global equities, which is a combination of the S&P 500 and uh, uh, MSCI fee indexes. And then you can see where your global fixed income is is as well. So in summary, your global fixed income has done extremely well. The total portfolio is right on top of the benchmark, and there is no more really risk by asset class. Next page. This is just a picture that gives uh, uh, you a feeling of how Montana Community Foundation has continued to grow, change, diversify their portfolio over various just snapshot years. We picked some off just to show you how back in 1990 to 93 to 99 continually increased the exposure to stocks, that would be the blue. Then you can see where in 2001 started to diversify into international stocks. And then over time diversified into real assets, multi-strategy, which would be uh, alternative investments. We got some private equity. Uh, so you can see it's a very, very diversified portfolio, very dynamic portfolio, and changes are made constantly to what we hope capitalize on opportunities in the market globally. So that gives you a feel of just how dynamic the portfolio has been over time. And that's really a summary of uh, where the portfolio is, how important the investment policy is that governs and um, helps us uh, make good good decisions in times of volatile markets and challenging markets. And the investment policy is taken very, very seriously by the Investment Committee and Montana Community Foundation. And quarterly re, uh, performance is evaluated and benchmarked and studied uh, uh, very, very closely. So any questions?
Thank you, John. Yes, and I'd love to open it up to questions from anyone, uh, whether it be about investment results or other questions about MCF. <coughs> Uh, John, on uh, I'm not sure of the page. I think it was 18 or 19. There was a table that showed returns uh, gross of fees. I think it said, uh, "Is there a similar table for net of fees?" Yes, that could be produced. One of the things that um, Global Investment Performance Standard, it's called GIPS. They uh, require both. Uh, gro when gross of fees are shown, they require benchmark, which is gross of fees. So that can be some of the challenges that benchmarks are always gross of fees. They, but yet we all know that benchmarks have fees in them. So to answer your question, yes, you will. Uh, we continue to uh, capture and uh, report more and more net of fees. In fact, Emily may uh, want to speak to that because we're trying to capture net of fees more and more and present them more and more as well. Yeah, I, I, I sure think one more line on that table would be interesting, and then you could explain that in the discussion. Okay, great. Ken, is that Ken on the call there? It is. All right, Ken. Hi. <laughs> That's a really good comment and good question. Um, we didn't. I, we can sure share that with the group and um, present that in future uh, webinars. We are trying to. Be sure to show you know apples to apples, um, and that's why we did do the slide with just showing that per portfolio performance gross of fees versus the benchmark gross of fees because the the benchmark numbers aren't available with a net of fees um, amount, so that's it makes it difficult to compare that then against net of fees performance. So, but yes, we do track that information. Okay. I welcome any other questions that might be out there. Who do you like in the World Series? <laughs> <laughs> Thanks very much. Yeah. yeah. Um, also, just to let the group know that um, Happening on Thursday and Friday this week in Helena is the Montana Nonprofit uh, Association Conference. Uh, Montana Community Foundation is a lead sponsor of that conference, and we will have a table at the event. If any of you are in the Helena area and wish to stop by, we'll have staff members um, at the table throughout the days of Thursday and Friday, and we'd welcome to be able to answer any questions you might have or just even to say hello. So. This webinar will be available um, as a recording on our website in the next few days. So if you need to uh, share it with your, um, any of your colleagues on boards or any other staff, you're welcome to come to our website and be able to hear that recording. And most of all, I just want to make sure that you feel comfortable to you know, reach out to us anytime. I've added the slide that gives the contact information for myself directly. And I just welcome any opportunity to, to answer questions you might have or give a call to us here in the office. Uh, Mary, I, or any of the other staff will be happy to, to visit with you. So thank you so much, uh, everyone, for joining the call today. We sure appreciate your interest. And uh, so we're so grateful to work with you on increasing philanthropy in Montana. I hope that you have a wonderful afternoon. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.